Salam, everybody. Welcome to uh, today's edition of the Samoar Network. Um, we are a monthly series uh, through Google Plus and YouTube where we connect with the Afghan diaspora to talk about issues that are affecting our community. Uh, so we're excited to have everybody here tonight. Uh, please tune in to the uh, YouTube page to watch our videos. Uh, go on Facebook to comment, questions, um, participate in this discussion. Uh, but basically, we want this opportunity for everyone to uh, come together and just talk about the different things that we have um, going on in our community. This month we'll be talking about love and marriage, obviously a topic that is um, on many uh, people's minds, especially within our community. Uh, so we're just going to quickly, we're going to try to get started real quickly uh, and just say your name and where you're calling from. Um, and then we'll, I'll start with myself. My name is Omar and I'm calling from Fremont, California. Um, and then we'll go to my left, which is Sabrina. Hi everyone, my name is Sabrina. I'm calling from Oakland, California. And Saba? Hi, my name is Saba and I'm calling from the Bay Area, California. And Reza? Hi everyone, my name is Reza and I'm calling from Los Angeles. And Nura? Salam, I'm Nura and I'm calling from North Carolina. Uh, my name is Iqbal. I'm calling from Concord, California. And Arza? Hi, my name is Arza. I'm calling from D.C. Ahmad? Hi, I'm Ahmad. I'm calling from Los Angeles, California. And Afifa? Hi, my name is Afifa, and I'm calling in from San Diego, California. Awesome. Thank you all for introducing yourselves real briefly for the folks who are watching tonight. Uh, we have bios up on the Facebook page if you would like to get to know a little bit more about everyone's background. Um, so we want you all to check out all the awesome folks that we have here. I think everyone has a, really, a lot of really great things to, um, to contribute tonight. Um, but we want to just jump in and just kind of get started for us. So the topic for tonight is love and marriage uh, within our community, within the Afghan diaspora. Um, so I'm going to start off with the first question is, first of all, um, a lot of people can be very, very hesitant about talking about this issue. So do you think it's socially acceptable for us to even discuss this as in openly in the Afghan community? I'll start with that question, and then Ahmad, you can go ahead and get us started. Thank you, uh, Omar. Uh, I, I believe so. I mean, I believe we should have uh, an open space and a safe space for us to discuss any issue uh, at this moment, I mean, especially our generation and myself being married, uh, I find it very easy to discuss uh, the experiences that I've gone through. And I think we should encourage everyone to have that type of mentality. So uh, I think it would be encouraging for all of us here to start this conversation tonight. And I think it may help other people open up as well. So I think it takes a lot of courage and bravery, but I think we can all do it. Iqbal, go ahead. Um, uh, I'm on the same boat. I agree. I think um, just a kind of a high level, I think if we're going through something in our lives, especially something as important as love and marriage, that uh, you should be open and honest about it. Uh, I don't think it's anything worth hiding or being afraid of, but you know, our community tends to do shame about that later. I think, Paul, I think we, we kind of you, you cut off a little bit there, but we'll go to Nura next. Yeah, um, that was the only thing I think coming into this conversation, um, being someone that's unmarried, the few times I call my mom and ask, and I was like, I'm going to be on this call tonight. Is that going to look bad? In the sense that it is something, especially for women, that we have to think about is that it's an important conversation. I'm so happy we're having it. But we have, at the same time, like Iqbal was saying, there is shame and taboo around even having a conversation openly about it. But that's what makes me excited about tonight because I think there are important issues collectively as a community we have to discuss. Uh, so, what are some of the things, the, the messages that you all have learned about marriage and love and, and all those things growing up? Uh, like, we have messages. Obviously, many of us are, are, are you know part of the Afghan diaspora, so we have messages and things that we see and we get from our our family, our community. Uh, but then we also live in this other world, um, you know, within the U.S. and, you know, outside of our home. So um, talk a little bit about 
uh, what the messages that you received growing up and maybe um, whether there was some some conflict with that or whether there were some things that aligned for you. Um, so I'm going to look for some of you to share some of those some of those awkward moments or things that you uh, you had growing up for those of us we can relate to. And I'll call on people if I have to. Reza, go ahead. Uh, so speaking to my experience alone, uh, I grew up in a very sort of merged household. My mother came here when she was um, 16 or 17, and so she grew up with a lot of American customs uh, as a teenager, and just sort of acclimating to them wasn't as difficult as it, is for, as it was for my dad. And so I kind of got this which is about I really appreciate it if you married a Muslim woman and uh, my dad's always hinting, hey, nudge, nudge, there, there are Afghan girls that you're hanging out with, right? Uh, and so um, combine that with, you know, things like Boy Meets World, which, uh, you know, I think for every boy in the 90s sort of became this, ah, Cory and Topanga, you know, I need to find my Topanga, that kind of thing, uh, that sort of like toxic mixture of, uh, naivete and perfectionism that was their relationship, you know, on TV. And so all of that sort of merged into um, a lot of expectations on my part for finding someone that I loved and that I uh, respected and um, someone that could uh, fit, hopefully, my parents' expectations. Obviously, I haven't really um, fulfilled that second half uh, because I'm, I'm not dating an Afghan Muslim woman. But uh, it's it, that's sort of how I was shaped, with two very different things sort of merging together. Afifa, go ahead. So some of the ideas, sorry, that I grew up with um, about marriage, you know, some of the things that were communicated to me, sometimes verbally, um, sometimes just through different facets in the community, were things like. Um, you know, at least in the in the Afghan discourse, is that you know marriage is like a one-time thing, right? It's very important that there's a timeline to it, um, you know, and especially as a woman, that there's a um, a particular timeline, or um, you know, before the age of 30, right? Things like that are are pretty common um, communications. Um, you know, that it was always clear in terms of um, what the limitations were um, in growing up here and kind of who you marry, how you get married. Those things were always very clear. Um, whereas I think in contrast, kind of growing up. Uh, you know, in a culture that's dominant after American culture, that a lot of communications about um, love and marriage are very different, right? I think there tends to be this idea that you fall in love, right? Um, and I, I don't know if anybody here or, um, would like to be uh, interested in reading it, but like um, Bell Hooks, one of, our, one of my favorite authors, she writes a lot about this concept of like, what is it like falling in love and what does that really mean and what are, um, you know, how do we create that into something that's more passive? Whereas I think in the Afghan community, um, the idea was that it's also a very active process and that, um, you know, uh, love is something that comes out of a consequence of marriage, uh, potentially, right? So those are kind of like some of the themes or some of the core things that stood out about love and marriage, um, you know, some of the things that I had grown up with and, again, how those two um, really do contrast at times. And for, okay, so my question to you all is who were you told to marry? Who was uh, what was the what was the criteria you were supposed to have uh, for marriage for for finding a partner and for those of you who maybe you know uh, you know are married or, or engaged maybe you could kind of share like what that you know if there was if there was any conflict with that or what that was like for you yeah who did who did uh, who did the family or who did who did your community say you were supposed to be with Arzo go ahead um so. My mom said it had to be someone. She had it narrowed down to the province. I mean, she wanted someone that wasn't just Afghan. They needed to be from Wardak. They needed to... She went as far as even mentioning what region of Wardak she'd prefer over which. And, I mean, being somebody that grew up in California and not connected to the Afghan community at all, majority of my life, you can imagine how hard that was, uh, how difficult that was. Uh, my first, I think, exposure to Afghans was until like later high school, and even then, it took me a very long time to understand, um, you know, anything about my identity. So it was really hard, and, and I never. It was very, very difficult. So instead of, instead of her putting 
emphasis on character, which my dad did, though. That's I think that's where I was able to, um, I had that support system. My dad, he was all about, look, I don't care if he's um, Afghan or what. He did care about faith, but only because of potential conflicts arising out of it, not because he felt that, you know, he, being Muslim is um, going to make a person a better, you know, a mate for you. But he just felt like that was going to be a, um, an issue that would, uh, possibly cause problems later down the line when having kids. So that was the only why he'd even push, you know, for somebody that would be Muslim. But he didn't care about the the race or anything like that. He just cared about somebody that would make you happy. Um, so I had him supporting me. However, he would, you know, encourage the whole. Um, he encouraged the importance of that person's resume, you know, on their educational background and and um, you know the kind of uh, you know schools they went to, things of that nature. So it was really really hard. But I will say, my mom was very ethnocentric in her in what she wanted for her kids. And even now, I have a younger sister who's 26 years old. Um, I cannot ever imagine her, I can't believe I'm going to say this live, but I can't imagine her ever ending up with an Afghan person, and my mom will not have the discussion with her. Like, she doesn't want to have the discussion, and my sister will tell her, Mom, you have to understand, I've never till this day um, connected with an Afghan. I, it's not going to happen, and my mom is so... She, she doesn't want to have a discussion at all. Like she, It's going to be really, really hard. And we cite examples, too, people in our family that have married non-Afghans, um, white people, and of uh, different races. And we'll say, like, look how an amazing guy so-and-so is, and she just doesn't want to hear it. And she'll be in complete agreement of how an incredible person that, you know, individual is to his wife. But when it comes to her own kids, I don't know what it is, but they it's maybe a sense of pride or, or um, I don't know what it is, but they want to preserve this identity in the family. And my mom feels very, very strongly about it. And I think that's probably a reason why my sister, you know, remains single today. So <laughs> Appreciate the honesty. <laughs> uh, Iqbal, go ahead. Uh, I mean, mine's pretty straightforward. My mom has always just said, you know, one, make sure she's Muslim um, for obvious reasons, and then two, if she's Afghan, it's great, but if she's not, then that's okay, too. But the only real criteria ever was that she's Muslim. And how, uh, how, did, how did your family feel about, um, I, you know, one of the poll questions that we asked was, is it important to marry an Afghan? Um, is that something that is important? So um, we had a lot of different responses on the poll questions. Uh, in regards to that, and so I was hoping some folks could, you know, maybe elaborate on that a little bit more, and I can call on some individuals if I have to, but um, would love to hear some from people here about whether or not it's important to marry another Afghan. Sabrina, let's hear it. We haven't heard from you yet. You know, I think that question is so is so broad reaching. Is it important to marry another Afghan? Um, I, I think yes. I don't think it's unimportant. Um, however, I think that you run into complications when, um, you know, you're asking your child to be with someone that they don't want to be with. I think that's where the conflicts could arise. Um, I think it just depends on who you're most compatible with and who. Um, who fills your needs and your wants, and who who is the best fit with your family? I think it's important in the sense that like our cultures are similar, that so that you know whoever you do end up marrying, you can spend the rest of your life with, um, that they can mesh well with your family. If you don't have to get them up to speed. Um, but at the same time, me personally, do I think it's important? Not really. Um, especially the the day and age that we live, how many of the things like at what percent are you really Afghan, right? Like, you might be Afghan on Eid and during Ramadan, right? Um, you might do traditions with your family stuff. But, like, Monday through Friday when we're just working, like, are we any different from anybody else in the States? Like, does it really matter? Um, that's just me personally. And Sabrina, go ahead. Um, yeah, I was going to say, growing up, you know, I remember um, a family member told me, you know, you should marry an Afghan because the Mamanese will be easier that way. So I just thought it was so funny that she kind of referred to that one example that my potential future spouse would affect her the most. So it's just kind of interesting to think about it in that way. And she didn't really allude to a lot of, um, you know, how a relationship works. It's more so uh, your your spouse should be compatible with the family. Your spouse should be 
um, integrated well with the family. So it's interesting to look at it from that perspective and then also looking at your own personal personal preferences. And Ahmad, go ahead. Well, myself, I mean, growing up uh, in high school, I was one of the only Afghans in my high school. So even though I grew up in the Bay Area, but I was in part of the Bay Area where there were no Afghans. So, um, so my thoughts and my upbringing and, uh, was pretty progressive. And then when I got into college, I started meeting Afghans and started talking to other Afghan girls and stuff. So, but when I started talking about my thoughts and my feelings and what I thought about the world and, and certain you know, controversial subjects, uh, they weren't really, uh, you know, happy about it or uh, I didn't think they were compatible with my thoughts. So therefore, I never thought I would marry an Afghan because I just thought, I, I, I didn't think I could find someone that was progress, progressive enough for me to um, connect with. So, so I didn't think it was important for me, or I mean, I wanted to marry an Afghan, but at the same time, like I thought there was some, I thought there would be some conflicts um, growing up or raising a family. But as I got older, I, you know, and the traditions and all that kind of drew me, and you know, and then online, going online and talking to other Afghan girls, <laughs> that's how I met my wife. <laughs> so, so and I found someone that I connected with, and I thought. Uh, because her uh, worldview or ideology was kind of lukewarm, <laughs> that I would be able to uh, continue with my progressive, uh, you know, upbringing and and kind of share that with her, and it would be an easier task. So, um, and has worked well on that end. So. Uh, and so we we're talking about um, marriage a lot, and just kind of that as being. Um, the goal for many folks, but um, even before you get to that point, obviously there needs to be um, hopefully some level of engagement that happens. So you're kind of meeting each other, whether that looks like dating or whatever, whatever that may be. But like outside of a, outside of being officially engaged or married, um, how easy or what are the challenges that we have to like having relationships or just you know dating in general? Um, you know, does our culture Support that is it? You know what are what are some of the challenges? You know, what, what, go ahead, Reza. You can go ahead and touch on that. Um, I think this goes back to something that Ali posted on the Facebook page itself, and it, it was a really great question, and it brings up a really great point. Uh, <clears throat> things like dating in our diaspora culture is very gendered, and there's a hypocrisy that a lot of I guess mardom, you know what I mean, like people in the community have uh, around women dating and men dating. And I know for me that, uh, God bless my mother, she's really open and very welcoming of the fact that like I'm dating and that I'm honest with her about dating. And I know that there are a lot of women like her who are um, just as open and welcoming about their son's dating. But when it comes to their daughters, uh, all of a sudden everything just becomes, uh, there's a hyper uh, vigilance that occurs with um, the women that uh, in our culture, in our community. And uh, I think that hurts in a lot of ways because the women aren't able to express themselves in a healthy way. And that can lead to secret relationships with individuals that may not be good for them, but they can't really reach out to their parents to help them in those kinds of situations because the parents don't know that they're dating. Um, and so I think that dating is very gendered, and there's a huge amount of hypocrisy, at least within the diaspora that I've seen. You go ahead, Sabrina. Absolutely. Uh, re echoing off of Reza's thoughts, um, it is very gendered. You could almost say there's two different cultures when it comes to um, Afghans, Afghan males in the di diaspora dating and Afghan females in the diaspora dating. Um, it just doesn't exist, I feel like, for females. That conversation, I think, has never been opened. Um, personally, speaking from personal experience, my parents never talked to me about dating or about relationships. Um, however, when it came to my brothers, it was a totally different story. So I think that for um, women to feel more empowered in our community, in our diaspora, that conversation definitely needs to be had. Um, I think it's so important for mothers to reach out to their daughters and talk to them about that, about dating and relationships. Um, but it's definitely a huge, huge uh, drift in our community when it comes to um, men and women and the differences uh, for dating. 
so so we have these these challenges and these uh, these difficulties that we've kind of expressed, and uh, especially you know uh, between men versus men versus women. Um, so what are the you know what are the challenges with that? Like how do you, how do you get to know somebody then if you're if you're if you're having um, you know if if it's kind of looked down upon, especially for for women. Um, and for men, you know, you also can't be as open about it. So how do you, what do you do? How do you kind of uh, go around that or get around that in some ways? Saba, go ahead. Um, so this is kind of interesting because I was having a conversation with a few friends um, earlier this week about these topics. Um, and it's, especially amongst my, my um, like my girlfriends, it's something we talk about a lot. Um, and you have like two different systems that you can you can operate by, right? You can go through your traditional cultural or religious route of trying to meet somebody, try to get to know somebody. Um, you know, go through the moms, your aunts, your uncles, your the dads. Even though girls don't usually approach their dads, you know, when it comes to trying to get into a relationship, um, or you can try, you know, like what we talked about earlier, kind of go underground and under the radar and try to you know date around and meet people. But that Creates like a whole host of other, both both come with their problems, right? Um, and I think like for women, especially um, when I was growing up, you know, dating was obviously forbidden. Um, we didn't talk about love, and um, we I was taught the first and foremost should always be my education, my education, my education. That's the bohanam. And then after that, I can think about, you know, marriage. But there was never any, like, context given in terms of how, you know, in terms of, like, even knowing how to have a conversation about marriage, right? You don't, if you've, if you've been forbidden and, and even, maybe even friendships at times with the opposite gender, you know, how are you all of a sudden supposed to um, know how to, you know, pick somebody to spend the rest of your life with. Um, these are these are big challenges, and and especially for women, I feel like we have um, kind of like this superwoman complex that we have to deal with, where we're expected to have our careers under the belt, we're expected to have like you know the highest degrees we can, and we're expected to be married and be producing babies by a certain age, and that's not very realistic, you know. Um, when you when there's also expectations of how you're supposed to meet someone within the cultural dynamics, and and if that entails not really being um, in touch with the op, you know with the opposite sex, and if it entails not dating and getting to know them, how do you do that? And one of um, the things that we talked about was when um, you're when we're younger, it's very we're, things are really strict with the women, especially. But as and there's rules and guidelines that we're supposed to like adhere to. Um, but as we get older, and like once you hit, I would say like your mid twenties, and, and you start to get older, the parents start to rip the rule rules out of the book, and they start to become more and more relaxed because they're much more concerned with their daughters getting married, and they realize, especially um, in America, that it's much more challenging um, for those rules to really work um, in the system. And that's, I mean, and that's just kind of like from a woman's perspective. That's some of the things that I've noticed. Yeah, I. No, go ahead. Yeah, I just to piggyback off what Sabah John was saying. Sort of marriage is a life marker, a trajectory for success. For women, is such an important thing that we. So growing up, there was no differentiation in my household between myself and my three brothers, and so you know we all went to college and we're all doing our professional thing. But suddenly we're all hitting above, like around the age of 25, and then it's like, oh wait. Um, you're not married and that conversation suddenly starts to begin and then it's like it doesn't matter what job you have or where you are with your education career it seems like the community the only value they have for women is at that point whether or not you're married and so any other success you've had up to that point and this isn't just an Afghan problem this is a problem I've seen with other Muslim women and women of color I have a lot of friends here I live in the south so there are a lot of black women that are highly educated here and they're from homes from Alabama and Mississippi and stuff and they talk about when they go back home their grandparents are like what's this law degree or med degree about you're not married yet what are you up to so I don't know if the guys can kinda weigh in if they feel that same pressure they might but I can just speak as a woman's experience having this conversation with Muslim women and other women of color 
this is something that comes up in terms of our success in life is, is measured by whether or not we're married. Uh, I definitely want to get back to that question. So um, for the men on the panel and those on Facebook, have an answer ready um, for that. So Afifa, before we, and Afifa, you wanted to jump in? Go ahead. Yeah, one, I mean, I agree with Nora, so I would love to go back to that point. Um, but one thing that I did want to address also was, um, you know, in terms of dating and getting to know somebody and kind of the shame and secrecy and stigma that comes with that in our community or, you know, whether you call it dating, whether you call it talking to somebody, whether you call it um, getting to know somebody, courting, whatever title you want to give it, right, and whatever that looks like, um, that there is generally some degree of secrecy with it. Um, and I know that, you know, there were some conversations going on about that uh, on the discussion postings earlier as well, but just the fact that um, secrecy does take a toll, right, on relationships, whether that's, you know, the two people involved, whether that's um, with family and friends around, right, that, um, that secrecy does take a toll um, on the relationship, and I wonder how our community can move towards, um, you know, because most people, and even on the polls, most people agreed, right, that, um, that there isn't necessarily anything wrong with getting to know somebody um, you know, that you're considering for marriage or for relationships, right? But how do we move towards making that more socially, religiously, culturally acceptable, right? Um, so that's kind of one question that I would prompt, and maybe if people are interested to um, address that on the Facebook page as well. Uh, so uh, just jumping back on Nura's question about for, for some of the men here, um, is our success tied to marriage? Like, does it hold the same weight for men as it does for women? Um, so, uh, Iqbal, go ahead. No, not at all. I mean, you, you could be a single male and not be married, and if you're doing really well in your career, then that's what people look at. That's what people see, right? Like, oh, he's not married, he's becoming a doctor. Oh, he's not married, he's working on a second business or something. But the, for men, it's, it's not tied to the success at all. And it... It's it is a double standard, and like what um, Sabrina said, it it almost is like a second culture for women, and um, we just share very different experiences. Reza, go ahead. Um, I I agree with Iqbal to a point. I think that once you get to a certain age as a man, if you're not married by then, you um are seen as oh, there's something weird with you. Right, and you can see that reflected not just in Afghan diaspora culture, but also in American culture. If and if you guys remember Lindsey Graham, who was running for president like months ago, right? He's not married, and everybody like the rumors around him just swirl about like, oh, is he gay? Why? And then you have questions like, is gay being a bad thing for his voters and everything like that? Because he's not married, and he's old. And so I think um, when you get older as a man and you're not married, that affects your ability to participate in the community because everybody just sort of, sort of like shies away from you and that's shaming in and of itself when people want to create physical and emotional space between you and them. Um, when we're like around our age, it's a lot easier for a man to be single and work on his career um, and do whatever he wants with the women in his life uh, and people sort of turn the other way towards it and then they, like I said before, are hypervigilant about women. But when you get later on in life, things sort of equalize out, and marriage sort of is the goal for when you're, like, 50. Go ahead, Sabrina. Um, I recently was engaged, got engaged um, a couple of months ago, and it's really interesting to see the reactions you get from family members. As a woman, in particular, people, people's reactions have been kind of like, I've just achieved this amazing accomplishment that I just climbed Mount Ever the equivalent of Mount Everest, um, which I'm very happy to be engaged, but it's very interesting from a gendered perspective to see how they people react to me being coming engaged as a woman to a man. And I think that might probably goes beyond um, Afghan culture and the Afghan American diaspora. But there definitely is a very um, gendered uh, divide there for getting engaged and getting married. Um, it's very interesting to look at. Uh, someone had asked on Facebook um, what in particular is important to them about Afghan culture because um, I think a lot of people talk about wanting to retain it or keep it like what what is it that is so important that we we do that uh, Ahmad go ahead 
Um, for me personally, uh, I think the food, uh, <laughs> the music, certainly, uh, the poetry, uh, some of the philosophies, some of the, you know, so, so I, I think those aspects of the culture I, I gravitate towards and also certain, um, you know, certain nuances in, in our culture that uh, we can gravitate towards, and it just becomes uh, second nature to us. So, but and and I can't really reflect on it because I've just adopted it. But but those are the most uh, important things to me. And uh, now that I have uh, a couple of two kids, um, I want to pass those on. And uh, some of the traditions, like eat, obviously, uh, is very important. I think uh, for them to understand, there's these traditions that uh, that the community, uh, you know basically participates in and, and they should be aware of it. But, but certainly I think uh, music, food, and poetry and some of the philosophies uh, are very interesting for me and I, I like to pass those on to them. And uh, go ahead, Nora. I was just going to say the only thing with marrying an Afghan is the connection to the, the resilience and political experience of our parents. Is something I think about a lot. Like, can someone who's not Afghan share in the story of the like our our family's generation is so distinct in the trauma they've went through getting here, right? And so, and it's shaped our experience as second generation Afghans in such important ways that I think about what it means to share that with a partner or not. And I don't know if that's important or how much value people put into that, but that's something I know I I constantly think about if that's important to have in a partner or not. Uh, I have a, w one of my questions. We keep we talk a lot about marriage and like you know that that's kind of the ultimate goal. Um, is marriage even important? Uh, is that even something that we should be aspiring to? Um, why, if if it is, why why is that something that we do aspire to? Why is it something that we always talk about? Um, can somebody have a happy life without being married? You know, or is that something that uh, we need? Is that something that was taught to us, or you think we, we need that? Um, Iqbal, we'll go to you, and then uh, we can go to Maud afterwards. Um, I haven't. I mean, I'm sure you can have a a happy life being single your whole life. Um, I'm only comparing this to the people that I know. Um, most of the people you asked, and they're like, "Hey, would like you know, you're married. Like, would you get married again?" The usual answer is like, no, I wouldn't. I wouldn't do it again. But it's, I, I feel like it's always a joke. And deep down at the end of the day that they're happy that they're married and they have some kind of connection with that, at least one other person in the world. Um, so I don't know. I can't answer the question. Is if, you, if you're single, can you be happy? I'm not sure. But I do know that I've seen a lot of happiness when two people are together. And I have seen a lot of like gham or like, yeah, gham I guess is the best word, when two people were together but they're now apart. Um, I'm not sure. I'm not sure if that answers the question. Sure. But, no, no, thanks. Yeah. We'll go to Ahmad next. Well, I mean, uh, let me break. I just want to break this down um, between what marriage is and what you know, two consenting adults in a long-term relationship or committed monogamous relationship. So, so let me break down. So, myself growing up, uh, I was like, I'm against the institution of marriage. So that's one of the progressive, I guess, you know, ideologies that I had. And I thought I wouldn't be able to find an Afghan woman that can relate to that or be compatible with that because I needed to explain that. So, I mean, so the institution of marriage, I thought, I found it to be very patriarchal and uh, didn't have a lot of equality built into it. So therefore, I felt that I didn't believe in the institution of marriage in that form, but I also didn't judge people that were married so for me personally, I was I wanted to say, listen, I don't agree with the institution of marriage, but two adults can have a monogamous long-term relationship and be very happy together and live a long life and you know take care of kids. But as far as the institution comes from, uh, you know into place, as far as that, because marriage itself is an institution, and I feel like marriage, the institution of marriage, has nothing to do with love. Love is between those two people that are in a relationship and the institution is separate and is mandated by, legally by the state or religious law. 
uh, if you will, in certain, in certain uh, countries. So uh, that's where I find the distinction between the two. So go ahead and uh, pass it on to the next person. Go ahead, Arzo. Um, so prior to meeting my husband, um, I was obviously single, and I was very content and very happy. Um, in fact, um, sorry. Uh, in fact, I was okay with the idea of remaining single for the rest of my life. I was very happy with that. Um, I was almost, you know, you can almost consider me as a commitment foe at that time. I just didn't, I didn't want to give up my individual identity. I want, I was very ambitious. I still am, and I wanted to make sure that there wasn't going to be anyone that was going to get in the way of that. Um, but when I met Omar, when I realized that, you know. The, the essence of who I really am wasn't going to be threatened by his presence or by the idea of marriage with him. Um, I was okay with that. So, I, you know, I never felt, yeah, despite my aunts and, and mom and dad always chiming in and saying, you know, so when, when is it your time? I'd always take it, you know, with a grain of salt and saying, yeah, right, it's not my thing. I'm, I'm okay with staying single. And I was really, truly, genuinely comfortable with that. I, um, but then, you know, I met somebody that I felt like I can share my current, you know, my happiness that I have, you know, within me now with somebody that has also achieved, you know, the same. So that was just um, my take on being, I guess, formerly single and now married and being happy with both. So. <laughs> uh, and we had another question um, directed towards the men. Uh, so to put you all on the spot, um, and the question from Juana Sultani asks, uh, when seeking a wife, do you steer clear of women more ambitious slash successful than you? Reza, go ahead. Uh, no. <laughs> um, many, uh, my, my girlfriend right now that I'm dating, I often compare her to Leslie Nope uh, from Parks and Rec. If anybody has watched that show and has seen... Uh, um, Amy Poehler kick butt and throw on amazing festivals for the small town of Pawnee, Indiana. Uh, so uh, that I'm honestly attracted to somebody who is living their own life. I don't. I, I think that when I was younger, I used to be attracted to this idea of a woman who was equal to me, which is um, now that I look back on it in retrospect, extremely arrogant, and it sort of puts me on a pedestal as much as I'm putting her or at least trying to put her on a pedestal. Um, because then what's happening to the other women who interact with it, with me that I'm not in a relationship with me, uh, or who aren't in a relationship with me? Are they not equal to me all of a sudden? So I think that um, I really had to grow out of a mentality where I'm looking for my quote-unquote equal, and instead was looking for someone who was independently uh, a person who not only I could love for their qualities and uh, what they did, so internal and external things, but also someone who lived independently of me and uh, inspired me and uh, made me look on her in awe and respect. That's like super number one now, like just someone that I could respect, whose opinions I respect. Um, so yeah, I, I definitely think I do um, not shy away from someone who is more ambitious or more successful than uh, Iqbal, go ahead. Um, I hear about that a lot, um, but it's weird because I never get to know, like, on an individual basis, like, oh, so-and-so, you know, he was really intimidated and it didn't work out. Um, so I don't know where it's happening. I believe that it is happening. Me, personally, no. I think if a girl's doing... Um, I think if she's doing something, like, successful and that she's making moves, I think that's extremely sexy. And um, I think that's what people should be looking for, right? Like, I mean, you're going to spend your life with somebody. Wouldn't you want that somebody to be just as dope as you think you are, right? Um, so I don't, know, I don't know where it's happening, but I think, people, I think guys especially need to get over it and, and start realizing like, the opportunities that they may be missing out on because of some ego or some like, notion of gheirat or providing that might be falsely instilled in the first place. So I, I, and I'm hearing what you, you both are saying, and also one of the things, though, I think about is, like, um, in especially um, 
if and I and I I've heard this word used a lot, like the word sanguine, right? Like, you know, a woman has to oftentimes apply, and that word is oftentimes applied to women, um, where it's like if they're too loud or if like they're like very out. It almost feels like if someone is like really outspoken, and I think that sometimes can be um, correlated with like uh, I guess quote unquote like success. Like people kind of look down upon that. Um, I mean, if you're gonna if you're gonna be really successful, it's gonna it's gonna require um, you know. Uh, being outspoken, getting to the top, but um, I do think that we, even though some of us say that we are not are are okay with that, that I don't know if that's necessarily the norm that's practiced. And I think it's like um, internally, uh, I think we might we've been conditioned to kind of shy away from uh, women who might be more outspoken or might be more um, engaged in that sense. And that's just kind of my opinion and what I've observed and seen. Um, but I guess I'm gonna also flip the question. Or Nora, did you want me to? Before I flip the question, did you want to jump in on this too? I mean, it was the my brother was messaging me and he asked this question. I think that was, will women marry men less successful? And I think that's an important question to ask too. Um, and I think it's interesting because at least, so I'm in a PhD program and I know my grandma's been like, oh, so-and-so would have been good for you, but he only has a bachelor's. So it's also that other people presume that you want a certain thing and that's thrown on women and men too in a certain way where they just assume, they're like, so-and-so asked and we said no well, because, you know, you're, you're a, you have an extra degree or something. So... I think it can, in this sense, we ha have to look at it at both angles and see what the tensions are in that. Um, and I think everyone has a different answer to that. Uh, and I don't think that success is measured by an educational degree personally, but um, I'm curious to hear what other people think. Go ahead, Saba. Um, I, would, I would definitely echo Nurajan, especially on her last point, that if... Um, you can't measure someone's successional degree, but the second part to that is um, who's to say that someone isn't going to advance their degree if that's something they want to do at a later time or, or whatever. Um, I think what I'm more concerned about is um, like uh, partners empowering each other to be, you know, to reach their highest potential. And so I, I don't think that it's fair for um, people to, you know, look at someone's resume and, and try to dismiss them based off of their resume and not, like, who they are within. Um, I, 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 my parents always taught me that, you know, education um, is important, but it's also something that can come, but there's a lot of other things that you can measure a person by. And, and number one, that's their character, right, and how they treat you and, and, and how they respect and treat the people around them and, um, and how they live their life with dignity. I mean, there's a lot of other things that are that are very important. And I think that um, looking to quote unquote success kind of says other things, like what we in our community um, value. And um, and so, you know, I I personally I I think the definition of success is very relative. Um, but either way, I think empowering each other is um, much more important. Uh, I think a couple people here wanted to kind of go back a little bit on um, the question of just being public about your relationship. Uh, did you all have something you wanted to add to that? Um, in terms of, I think Iqbal, you Iqbal, go ahead and say what you were what you were gonna ask. What you want to ask, folks? Um, so one of the topics on the on the Facebook page, or one of the questions was, um, it's comfortable being public in the community about an exclusive relationship, not engaged or married. Um, and I answer that question very differently than I think almost 27 other people did. And I said that it, it's, okay, it's okay to be in a relationship if you're not married or engaged in public. Um, and that, I, think that def I think it's very important how you define relationship. For me, relationship is like you're getting to know somebody for the sake of marriage um, to see if, if you and this other person are compatible. I don't know, maybe, someone, maybe these other people took that differently. Um, and I'm not saying what you do or you don't do in the relationship, but at the end of the day, if marriage is your goal, and we are, we have this lifestyle of like, okay, go go study, go study, go get your education, go get your degree, and don't talk to girls, and for girls, don't talk to boys, and then all of a sudden, when you graduate, it's like, hey, how come you're not getting married, right? So it's like, do we pretend that we're not interested this whole time, and then and then all of a sudden we flip the switch, 
And then when we do flip the switch, are we secretive about it and we lie to our parents and we lie to the community? Or are we upfront about it and we say, like, hey, this is what I'm doing and, and this is a person that I might spend the rest of my life with? I only say that because anyone that I've ever been interested in, seriously or not seriously, I've introduced them to my mom. Not in the sense to creep her out, like, hey, mom, like, I might marry this. Not to tell her, like, hey, let's come meet my parents. But in the sense of, like, hey, mom, I'm interested in this girl. Like, what do you think about her, right? Because if I'm going to spend the rest of my life with some girl, it's not my decision. It's, it's, yeah, it's, like, 95% my decision, but the rest of it's, like, did she get along with my sister? Did she get along with my mother? Did she get along with me in X, Y, and Z? So I'm, I'm not going to be selfish and make some decision that affects my whole family, based on myself, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I want to include my whole family in that decision. And I don't see how people can do that if your whole relationship is a secret to begin with, right? Like, how many times do we see, like, two people getting, like, they have a secret relationship, and then all of a sudden, hey, mom and dad, guess what, I'm marrying this guy, and then they're like, oh, we hate this guy, right? And then, and then at that point, what do you do? Do you choose between your parents, or do you choose between, your, like, your future spouse, right? So for me... It's like, why not include them in the conversation at the very beginning? And if it's not meant to be, and if it's not going to work out, why waste all that time and emotion and effort on something that is not going to bring you happiness? Because isn't that the goal of marriage, to bring you happiness? And Sabah, thanks for sharing that. Well, go ahead, Sabah. I mean, um, there's a couple of things I want to point out. But number one, if you go down the traditional, quote-unquote, route of um, suitorship and courtship, and you're going through the system of trying basically to find a suitable partner, that's a pretty public process too, right? You have everybody involved and, and it's, um, you're basically kind of on a megaphone. Um, basically partners are coming and going and people are being kind of X'd out pretty quickly. Um, and you, it depends on what your definition of dating is. Um, I actually posted that question um, myself because again it was something, one of the topics that um, some, you, my girlfriends had came up, and um, one thing that I realized is just how, and Afifa John pointed out, is how damaging it can be um, when you kind of go under the radar and try to enter into relationships, and um, you operate under this level of secrecy where um, when you are in public and you um, are in, you're in an exclusive relationship with somebody, you're trying to navigate your way through that, and you're in public within the community, you know. So you tend to pretend like you don't even know the person. And that, and I feel like those types of things can start to harm the relationship. It starts to harm your relationship um, as with the people in your community, with your families. And I totally agree with Iqbal. There's nothing wrong with um, you know, keeping your family in the loop if that's something you choose to do. But when you start to operate under privacy because you fear you know, community and family scrutiny, that's not like the healthiest place to start you know, a relationship to begin with and so um, I think like there's a lot of like these stigmas that is associated with quote unquote dating and being in exclusive relationships and um, and I feel like that needs to be unpacked and um, that there's absolutely nothing wrong with um, entering into like any kind of exclusive whatever you want to call it relationship talking to somebody getting to know somebody um, especially if the intentions are to have a committed relationship um, with the intention of marriage eventually um, being public about that or at least being um, less secretive about that might be healthier. So, and, then, and that's just a personal thing. Um, why hide it? But as a woman, I'll tell you number one, it's, um, that again is very challenging. Um, it's a really, really difficult thing to do and um, it, it's something that um, even me saying this like on a public live stream is kind of um, difficult. But I think that I've seen enough um, damage done just kind of like people around me that um, I've, I've rethought kind of the way I've been trained um, how to operate the system so um, <clears throat> I wanted to ask uh, for those of you thanks for, for sharing that um, what so we talk, we're talking about dating and the difficulties and all that but you know if you've been able to navigate that what is what is a good amount of time or what's what's the appropriate amount of time to know somebody um, before getting married, uh, getting married to them. Uh, so maybe some of you who uh, you know have gone through that process can can maybe shed some light on folks and 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 and, and share a little bit about your perspective on that. Um, Arzo, go ahead. You can start us off. 
Okay, so this is my husband, Omar, <laughs> <laughs> um, who I somehow talked into come joining us tonight. Um, so Omar and I, we met on Facebook, and I'm very, very <laughs> open about that. Um, and when we met, we met in, well, I was in Los Angeles. Um, I was... Three years later. Three years later, after being Facebook friends, yes, that's true. Um, and when we met, uh, I was very, very straight... Forward. I think he knew to me. He knew me to be a very independent, you know, Avian girl. Um, I think it took a few weeks for us to really get to know each other. I had barriers up, and so he knew he had some work to do to break down these barriers. And I was very straightforward with him. I said it from the very beginning. Um, look, I don't really want to waste my time dating, uh, so I'm going to just lay out everything for you. I'm going to tell you, these are my flaws, these are my habits, these are my expectations, this is what I want. Um, you could either take it or leave it. Um, and I said, and if you want to take it, then let's proceed and let's you know, be on a more serious level. But I also had you know, reservations, and I, I talked about it. I was very communicative. I was very honest about it up front, um, about things that... You know, I had insecurities, and I felt like it was either up to him whether or not he wanted to, to deal with certain uh, those insecurities. I think it's very important as females that we are very honest about um, those things. Uh, and I think that that's probably what you know. He could have even he could have at the very beginning been like, okay, this is a really crazy Avian girl. What am I getting myself into? But I think he In the back of my mind. I was. <laughs> But I think he also respected my honesty for not, you know, wasting his time. And it was probably the best, you know, decision ever because we kind of knew from the very beginning that this was this was really it. This was we were, you know, I think we realized that we didn't want to be with anybody else, and we were very quick to act. Um, it was one of those things where you know, you know. Uh, so yeah, that was my way. And again, it's unconventional. In the past, I wouldn't have done that. But I think that this was. The only time where I said, you know what, I'm just going to be completely, put everything out on the table, and it was probably the best decision of my life, but I've never really asked you how you thought of that approach. <laughs> I mean, it was, it was definitely different for me. I never really engaged in anybody like that, even through social media. I'm not really active on social media. Um, there wasn't really anybody on social media, any of my friends on social media that I haven't actually personally met. So even just having her, like someone that I had never really met before on my Facebook type of thing was, was a little strange for me at first. But it was fine. We were very cordial in, in our relationship through Facebook for three years, and we just saw each other as friends. We never really talked in that type of way. I never really tried to holler at her. Or she <laughs> never really, you know, we never really showed any type of interest like that. Um, it just happened, the fact that, you know, we were at the same place at the same time, and we ended up meeting up, and it was a couple weeks after that, and we, you know, we met up again, and we hung out here and there, and a couple months later, I was already in Virginia, and we got <laughs> engaged, like, a month after that. I mean, it was, it was pretty, pretty intense. Um, I don't know if I'd say, you know, we, we knew we wanted to be with each other, and it was part of our culture, part of our parents getting involved in a way, saying like, oh, you know, her introducing me to her mom, saying like, there's this guy that I'm talking to, me doing the same thing with my mom. Uh, they were like, okay, well, if you're going to move out to Virginia, it, whether it's for work or for her or for whatever the case is, then, you know, we need to make something, we need to legitimize it. So that was when the parents and that's the culture kind of came into effect where we were going to be with each other regardless, but the fact that we had to do it in a way that everybody was okay with so soon as well. I mean, this is still six months after we physically actually met each other in person. Now, we probably would have got engaged maybe if it was at our own pace, maybe at the a end year, of the year, yeah. yeah, year, year and a half tops. But we were kind of, I don't want to say forced, but we were, we were kind of forced. We were kind of forced. <laughs> we were kind of pushed. We, yeah. were, we were nudged along like, okay, if you guys really want to do this, then this is how you guys are going to have to do it to – you know, my family was about that, and so was hers. You know, it was like, you know, we have to save face. We can't just have you hanging out with some random guy that nobody knows from California, and people see you at the mall, and then people start asking questions and, you know, whispering and gossiping, and the whole Afghans, you know, typical Afghan stuff kind of comes into play. 
I think um, that's the only part where we allowed the Avian culture to actually play a role in our in our relationship. But you know, and then uh, that was the only thing. Otherwise, I think I, I would have been okay with us, you know, waiting a couple years before actually getting married. But it was it was that was when the culture played a played a role. But, and, and and it's actually definitely not easy with that. As ready as you can be, there's a lot of expectations when. You quote unquote become as in, in our culture. They kind of say you're not a man until you get married. You're not a woman until you get married. You know. So once that kind of you take that on as getting engaged, there's a lot of expectations. There's a lot of pressure on you as an individual, on you as a couple as well. That you that that comes that stems straight straight from the culture. You know. There's a lot of obligations, expectations, all of that where you don't really get that in our culture if you're single. You know. Mm -hmm. Is something that you know a lot of people don't actually. I just want to add one last thing: is Omar, by the way, did not grow up in an Afghan um, type of. You know, he's born in Idaho. He was raised in Southern California, but uh, he he, born he, in Idaho. <laughs> he, um, he knows he's more Latin than he is Afghan. So let's just put it that way. He could dance Latin music, dance with Latin music all night long before at ton. So you know, for us to come from where we were and the way we were raised, um, and then have to all of a sudden be so Afghan about the way we got married. It's, yeah, it's Oops. true. It was. I, I I grew up in Santa Ana in Orange County. Um, my family wasn't very, I would say, not very religious, but they're they were more traditional because I'm actually the youngest in my whole family or at least one of the others. So my family is a lot older, so they're a little bit more traditional, not so much religious. They're a little all up, you know, they kind of do their thing. They don't really care about anybody else, really, but they're um, they're not very, very religious, but they are traditional. So it was, it was different. For me, growing up in, you know, being in America my whole life, I never thought I was even going to, you know, marry a Afghan girl. That was never really in the back of my head. I, I know I knew a bunch of Afghan girls. I never really talk to them. I, I was never doing any of that um, in the past, kind of at the younger age of like the high teens to the younger 20s, where a lot of the Afghan community tends to kind of mingle a little bit. Um, I never really did that. Um, so going to Afghanistan is when I end up coming to the realization that I wanted to actually marry or be involved with the Afghan uh, woman. It was when I got more involved with my culture. Um, yeah. But, yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much for sharing. Uh, we really appreciate that. We're gonna. I mean, we, you two are gonna have your own show soon enough on Afghan TV. So I mean, save some for for everyone else. But I really appreciate both of you kind of sharing that story. That's awesome. Um, and we'll go to Ahmad next. Uh, I remember Arjo told me about Omar. So I just remember now. So. <laughs> so uh, uh, so let me let me take you guys back on memory lane with my relationship and how I met my wife Mariam. Uh, so I'm gonna take it back to uh, Afghan tea house AOL. <laughs> Some of you may have never heard of it, uh, but that was the platform we used. That was a, our social networking platform for Afghans to go meet. And it was funny. And another thing, let me uh, explain about it. The, the way the platform works, so it's just a thread, you know, um, and people go on there, you don't know what they look like, who they are, whatever, nothing about them, so, but the thing is, there was like, uh, in order to get into that room, the chat room, is like, it had like a 23 person capacity, so, like all night you were in there like trying to get into that room so you can talk to all the Afghan <laughs> guys and girls, so, so it was difficult to get in and get access once you did, and you're like trying to find out and see if you're really talking to a girl or not. So it, it was really difficult. <laughs> so, so once I did, so you know everybody had their own handles and people had multiple handles. Uh, I was uh, Mr. Universe. Uh, so, <laughs> so, uh, so I, I met my my wife there. Uh, obviously, other people have met their uh, you know, spouses there and. People have had divorces there too. So, anyways, um, so I met her there. So we started talking, and uh, we talked for maybe uh, I think uh, a year or two years almost. Uh, we started talking, and then we said, okay, now we need to make this official. So, um, uh, so we 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 made it uh, official by like. So once we've decided, like, okay, we're gonna go, you know, be serious about this and get engaged. 
then we had to kind of follow the, the traditional route, you know, going to Costco and pretending like we didn't know each other and uh, going and, uh, and introducing our parents and like pretending like I've never seen her in my life. Uh, so, uh, so uh, it was, I mean, it was like for me, it was like so uncomfortable. I was like, oh man, what am I doing? You know, was, this isn't this isn't right. So, so anyways, uh, we we went down that road. Uh, it took us like uh, you know three months to get engaged because you have to go there multiple times and introduce yourself and pretend like, okay, I want to meet you guys. Uh, we're just here for, you know, just to get to know you guys and then like pop the question and then you do your shoot me and then we did a Nicole and all that, all that stuff and then had two huge ceremonies, uh, Shinikuri and then the wedding. Um, but, but the whole process was, it, it, it was interesting because you're playing along with the tradition just so that all the family members out of respect for the family members, but your own relationship, the Nanax or your own relationship within yourself between the two people have already been made. And I think that's the important part where those two people have, you know, talked out about the relationship and what they want to do. And and I don't know how much time uh, it takes, but it, it took me a couple of years before we got married and engaged. Uh, so I just want to share that with you guys. Uh, Thank you for uh, Omar, that stuff. Go ahead, Akbar. What were you going to say? So in that situation that uh, Ahmed was in, um, and not your specific situation, but anyone's situation, because that's such a common theme for us, is like what happens at that point when literally no one in your family gets along with the person that you've been talking to? So what do we do then? This is my question to everyone. Cry. Do we, do we elope? Do we elope? Do we pick one side? Do we ruin one relationship for the sake of the other relationship? Do we 50-50? Like, what do you do in that situation? Just got real. I mean, I, yeah. <laughs> I mean, I, I can answer that because I went through that. So, so for me, I mean, we, I mean, we introduce our families, and we have such large families, and I have so many siblings, she had siblings on her side, and like. I mean, people have, I mean, especially in our culture, we, we have so many fiery and sharp views about certain topics, and our personalities are such, you know, strong and fiery people, and uh, it, it is almost impossible to get everybody to accept each other uh, and, and come to a common ground. But in the beginning, it is. It's, it's much more cordial. But as you get to know each other, then you have to, then you start figuring out your nuances and stuff, and then you can go from there. But... But I think it, I mean it just it just futile. I mean like just to begin I, to begin with. I mean it, it's hard to get everybody to actually like each other, and that's I mean I tried, and I think that was a wrong a mistake on my approach to try to have people to like each other. You can't. I think you just have to hope that everybody accepts each other and and, and respects each other, and and then create an environment where people are safe to. Have these conversations and, and and be open about who they are and and accept each other and rather than you know liking them. You know? So so that's that's what I've tried is to get people to communicate and have a safe place and and, and have some mutual respect and and that goes a long way. Ball keeping it real. Go ahead, uh, <laughs> yeah, I was just gonna say is to answer your ball's question about what do you do when. Um, your family or the community doesn't approve of, you know, potentially the person that you've chosen to be with or are interested in. And I think that happens a lot with, or increasing so with people who choose to marry or be with someone outside of the community or maybe outside of their own ethnicity or maybe outside of um, their sect, right? Um, and I think that's something that at least I'm seeing more and more so. Um, uh, I think um, Ahmad answered kind of how do you address that way with respect, communication, um, but just you know, something that um, I hope people would be willing to share more and more of. Uh, so, I got a question from a viewing party in uh, Antioch, California, uh, who wants to know how do you meet people or approach somebody if we have to be secretive? What are you? Uh, what do, What do we do in that situation? We talked about all the challenges that are opposed to us that are that we're fighting against. Um, so, so how do we do that? <laughs> what are the what are the tips people have here? How do you meet you, somebody you, if we have to be so secretive? We have to be so secretive in our culture. So how do you actually uh, meet somebody um, or approach someone with those uh, in our culture? 
Go ahead, Reza. I'll, I'll, I'll put the screen on you, my bad. Oh uh, no, no, no. I, I mean, I was, I was just asking for a clarification on a question. Like, is this, is this question asking us how to, how to uh, sneak around in our relationship and like start something? Uh, <laughs> I, I think the question is how do you navigate through those cultural barriers? Like, what is uh, you know what what do you do with all the challenges that are posed to us as 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 Afghans? Um, so how do we meet somebody? Like, what are what are the best ways to do that for dating anyone? Um, particularly, yeah, I think for a lot of us, um, whether it's Afghan or not Afghan, we we have to be kind of secretive about it. Um, so how do we navigate through that? <laughs> Go ahead, Nora. I, I, I don't know if I want to get in on this, but uh, I think that that's probably one of the biggest problems. Like, uh, Iqbal had talked about this earlier. Um, can women ask men if they're interested? And I don't, I think that that's a huge taboo in our community, and I don't know how we get across those hurdles and challenges. Um, I know for myself, my brother and sister are my age, and so matchmaking has been a thing whereby, um, you know, married people will be like, you know, I think that people who are married have this access to, like, help people, like, introduce each other, and that's one way around it. Um, I honestly don't have a better answer than that, except to say that um, that it is an important point that we just, we, especially the point of women. Like, I don't think women have the same access to kind of initiate things um, the way that men do, and that's something we have to figure out, like, how do we change the culture around that? Uh, yeah, I guess the kind of the question for some people may be wondering, like, do we need to have, like, speed dating sessions? Or is there something that needs to happen with an Afghan community that um, makes it a little bit easier for folks? I'm, I'm not sure the answer to that um, as well, but if anyone has any sort of thoughts on that or... Um, uh, tips to solve this this age-old question. Go ahead, Saba. You're going to enlighten us all. I have the answers to everything. Just ask me. No, um, <laughs> I was going to say, I really think it depends on um, the person. You know, I don't think, like, any one way, you know, works for, you know, everybody. So it's just, you know, there's multiple doors, m multiple ways you can go about it. And do what, do what's comfortable with you. You know, if it's like, if you're comfortable with online dating, then go for that. If you're comfortable with someone setting you up, then go with that. If you're just kind of the type of person who, you know, you might meet with somebody, you might meet someone, you might have a connection, and and then you go from there. Then you know, do what works for you. Um, and I guess like just kind of be open to having authentic and vulnerable conversations, especially if you're gonna go down that secret route. Um, it's really difficult. I can only imagine how difficult it is if, like, you're operating under secrecy and you're trying to figure out if someone, you know what I mean, if someone else might be on the same, you know, mindset as you, and it might be difficult and challenging to open up those conversations. But, you know, sometimes the most difficult conversations, um, the ones that we fear the most, are the most important ones to have. So that's like a favorite quote of mine by a poet, Naira Waid. So I would say that. Uh, go ahead, Reza, and then we'll go to Arzo after that. Um, I, I think uh, honesty and authenticity are really important things, uh, especially when it comes to re relationships and when you're just starting out dating. Um, I'm sure Arzo has a lot to say about this as well, so I'm going to try to keep it brief and sort of tack away to s another subject that uh, sort of revolves around gender and uh, privilege in that even if we are honest and authentic, uh, about our relationships and about when we started, there still may be repercussions. And I mean, I consider myself extremely lucky that when I started being honest and authentic about my relationships with my parents, they opened up and I found out that they were a lot more open-minded than I ever expected them to be. But I know and I understand that that comes from not just being a male, but also my parents having been educated in the West uh, quite a bit. And so if um, I, I can only imagine if someone who just came to America or someone who was born to America to parents who weren't so educated in the West decided to be open and honest and authentic. Um, if they were a man, if they were a woman especially, uh, those repercussions, those consequences could be harmful physically and emotionally. And so um, I think stress, honesty, and authenticity works for others, but I don't want people to leave this conversation thinking it's a panacea for 
everything that affects them. It's not going to solve every situation, honesty and authenticity. Sometimes it's going to take you coming with a, a group of individuals, uh, respected individuals, your people that your parents uh, will put a lot of stock in, and them having a conversation along with you, with your parents, uh, about relationships, dating, maybe marrying outside of your ethnicity, religion, or culture. And Arza, go ahead. Um, I just wanted to quickly, you know, know, I guess to all my girls out there, um, I cannot stress, you know, Reza's point, um, you know, of authenticity and honesty. Um, at the end of the day, you don't want to be with somebody that is going to like you for, you know, this facade that you put on. You want to be exactly who you are, and you don't want to end up, you know, two or three months later wondering why um, the person that, you know, you've been talking to or dating or whatever isn't as accepting anymore because of, you know, um, because of your true self has a surface. And also, I also think being somebody that grew up with the boys, um, guys are, you know, they react and respond uh, to our communication styles. And if we're very honest with ourselves and we're honest with them, then I feel like, you know, they tend to be very honest and, and authentic with you. So um, I just have to stress that it is honestly... To be yourself and to be real, you want somebody that's going to be accepting of that um, and not accepting of a picture that you painted for them. So, I think that was uh, life advice we could all definitely appreciate. Arzo, thank you for that. Um, what are some ways we can kind of move these conversations beyond just this, uh, this panel tonight? Um, how do we... Uh, how do we continue to engage in these types of things? You know, one of the goals for you know the Samoa Network is to you know have these virtual discussions, um, but also to you know expand beyond just just this virtual platform. And um, is it easy to do that? Um, are there opportunities for that? And how um, how can people um, talk about these issues like gender, um, religion, and those kinds of things? Those different expectations that people have of each other. Um, so how and then this is. Pretty much for any any one of these um, topics that we discuss. Go ahead, Iqbal. I think there's a conference right coming up in like um, in the near future. I think I it's. I think so. Uh, is it in March or April? March, March. Go ahead, Iqbal. Um, Sabrina. Yeah, there's a the Afghan American Conference is at UCLA this year, March 25th through the 27th. Great way to meet people. <laughs> nice. Uh, that wasn't meant to be a plug, but um, I just wanted to just kind of remind folks that um, these discussions that we do have here on the Samoa Network um, uh, is meant to is meant to go beyond uh, beyond just this this virtual platform, and uh, we want you all to uh, continue these conversations, continue engaging online. We'll you know we may not have been able to get to everybody's questions and thoughts. And I know we were kind of all over the place tonight, but this is a pretty big topic, and a lot of people um, are coming with a lot of different backgrounds and experiences and uh, knowledge um, to that. So uh, hopefully you all were able to gain something from tonight's conversation. And again, this is just the beginning. We want you all to continue with it, uh, whether that's online or in person or in whatever, um, uh, whatever format you find suitable. But... Thank you all for engaging, for tuning in tonight, and uh, we look forward to seeing you again in the future. Have a good night, everybody. <laughs>